Despite the fact that the German troops since the beginning of the offensive did not suffer particularly heavy losses, the combat strength of the infantry sharply decreased. The average company numbered 60 men. Many soldiers became ill from the continuous transitions, which required an overwhelming physical exertion. To this were added cardiovascular and gastrointestinal diseases caused by the unusual steppe climate, constant sharp temperature fluctuations. If during the day the mercury on the thermometer scale rose to 40 deg, and sometimes even higher, at night it fell to 10 deg. We had no shelter over our heads for the most part. It made no sense to spread out our tents for a short night's respite. The casualties caused by all these circumstances sometimes far exceeded the losses in battle. Of course, the worries and concerns of the first adjutant of the army increased. Where to get replenishment to make up for the losses? I telephoned the first adjutant of the army group. I was encouraged, promising a few part-time marching companies of soldiers discharged from hospitals and recognised as healthy and fit for combat service. But what would these few hundred men do when we had lost many thousands? At the evening report I informed Paulus about the situation. According to the army group, in the coming days the army should receive several marching companies. More replenishment is not expected yet. We've been fighting for about 400 kilometres. Some companies have lost a third of their combat personnel. Will the army will be replaced by the second echelon or the army group will give us new divisions from the reserves? Paulus smiled bitterly. When the advancing troops reach a certain point, then to accelerate the pace of advance is introduced second echelon or reserves. That's what you taught when you were a tactics teacher at the military school, right? And I don't think of it any other way. But I must tell you that there is no second echelon or reserves. Hitler's headquarters believes that it is possible to neglect the basic laws of strategy and tactics. The high command too often pursues political and military economic goals, believing that they can be realised by our undoubtedly proven troops. But there is a limit to everything. The army is exhausted, exhausted and very weakened by losses. It will be difficult when it comes to the decisive battle. At the beginning of the offensive, the army group had in reserve two German infantry divisions. The Allies, who follow us, should replace our divisions on the northern flank. Their fighting capacity is almost half ours. They are therefore unfit for the offensive. We'll have to bear the brunt of the battle for the city on the Volga alone. But how will it happen? I asked. Our tank corp is 150 kilometres from the divisions that have reached the Don. We have to make the crossing as soon as possible. In addition, the front that we need to provide from the north, all the time stretched. For further offensive will not remain and half a dozen divisions. Tomorrow we will be joined by XXIV Tank Corp, which used to be part of the 4th Tank Army, replied Paulus. But what happens? One hole patched, in another place a gap. Critically thinking general staff, Paulus could not help but notice the weakness and adventurism of Hitler's strategy. It disturbed him, tormented. But he was a soldier from head to toe, believed in his experience and relied on his troops. He hoped to correct the omissions and miscalculations of the high command. I left to my tent to formalise the lists of those presented for the award of the Knight's Cross and the Gold German Cross. The conversation with Paulus did not get out of my head, just as long as he did not give up physically he looked sick. Deep in thought, I stopped in front of a geographical map, stretched on thick cardboard, which always hung next to my desk. The Red Army was retreating farther east. More and more we were moving away from our supply bases, more and more unfavourable became for our divisions the conditions of combat operations. The single-gauge railroad at our disposal was our only transportation artery. It became more and more difficult to supply the troops. The rains would come, and as it happened more than once, vehicles with heavy loads would get stuck in the mud. Transportation means of the army were barely enough to deliver ammunition, fuel, food, etc. to the troops along these long distances. Stalled delivery of fuel delayed the offensive, often for many days. 
Chief of Staff raged, but responsible for supply quartermaster was powerless. Many times it happened that the transport with fuel, intended for us, taken and sent to Army Group A. The protests of the quartermaster and even the army commander were not taken into account. I was summoned to Paulus. His apartment was in a small house with haylofts and consisted of two rooms, one more capacious, the other smaller. In the large room, Paulus worked at a rectangular table, which sometimes had a chair. Behind Paulus's workplace was installed board, to which buttons pinned map of the situation. Personal adjutant of the commander-in-chief was obliged to ensure that the map is put on the latest data. In front of this map and stood Paulus when I entered the room. A few minutes ago I received a call from the chief of staff of the army group, Infantry General von Zodenstern. In about half an hour Colonel General von Weichs will fly here. He's going to pay us a visit. The Nachstabat has already ordered that a landing signal be put out at our field airfield. Bring the Colonel General here in my car. Drive out now and make sure everything is in order at the airfield. My driver will drive my car to your tent. This temporary airfield, a piece of steppe land with only the most necessary signs, was not far from the village where the Army Command Post was located. On the edge of it stood one Junkers 52 and a few more communication planes and storms, which were used by our headquarters. I waited with the commander of our aviation squadron on the field near the landing signal, which was laid out in the shape of the letter T white cloths. An airplane showed up. It flew very low, described a circle over the airfield and went to land. A tall, thin general in horn-rimmed glasses, looking more like a scientist than a military man, came out of the plane. I introduced myself to him first adjutant of the Sixth Army. Although we had never seen each other before, he greeted me as an old acquaintance, nodded to those present at the airfield and got into the car. At the command post there was a long conversation between him, Paulus and Schmidt. Later I learned from our commander that it was about the difficult situation of the Sixth Army, in which it found itself when the Fourth Panzer Army changed the direction of the strike. Colonel General showed full understanding and promised to provide on his part all possible support. Paulus told me, he, of course, cannot give us new divisions, but he will try to make sure that our units, which are used to ensure the northern flank on the Don, will be replaced as soon as possible by the following Allied armies. And the headquarters of the XVII Army Corps let it stay there. I allowed myself to object. But then we will be short of one corps' headquarters. VII Army Corps cannot lead all the infantry divisions of our northern group. Instead of the headquarters which we will give, we will get the management of the XI Army Corps, headed by Infantry General Strecker, replied Paulus. Strecker I know very well. He formerly commanded the 79th Infantry Division, which was in our subordination near Kharkov. This is a reliable man. In the directive, no. 45 from July 23, 1942, the tasks of Army Groups A and B were redefined. What were the assumptions of the Wehrmacht High Command? The first section of the directive stated only very small enemy forces from Timoshenko's army managed to avoid encirclement and reach the southern bank of the Don. This was a completely erroneous assessment of the results of the summer offensive of 1942 achieved by this time. A small number of prisoners, almost empty battlefields, Few killed these are the facts that strongly refute the assertions of Directive No. 45. The Directive went on to define the objectives of future operations. Army Group A was to part of its forces to advance into the Western Caucasus and along the Black Sea coast, and another part of its forces to capture Mykop and Grozny, to block the roads through the mountain passes of the Central Caucasus, and then break through to Baku. Before Army Group B said in the relevant section of the directive is tasked, as previously ordered, along with the creation of a line of defence along the Don River to strike at Stalingrad and defeat the enemy group being formed there, take the city itself and cut the river between the Don and the Volga in its narrowest place, as well as to interrupt the movement of ships on the Volga. 
After that, send mobile formations along the Volga with the task to reach a Strachan, and they're also to block the main channel of the Volga. If directive no, 41 prescribed to reach Stalingrad first by the forces of both groups of armies, and then to conduct further operations, then directive no. 45 required to solve all these problems simultaneously, in other words, to stretch the front from 800 kilometers at the beginning of the summer offensive to 4,100 kilometers after the end of the planned operations. This meant atomizing the forces of both groups of armies, although, as already noted, our own losses were far from being made up for. The directive did not change anything in the task assigned to the 6th Army already after the 4th Tank Army moved south to seize a large bend of the Don that was our immediate goal. We moved our command post further inland. While my section followed it by motor cars, I flew forward on a Fiesler Storch. We were already approaching our objective. Below us lay one of those common steppe villages here, which are separated from each other by a great distance, with one-story wooden houses, with flowering front gardens, with yards enclosed by fences, and with a wide and straight main street. The commandant of the army headquarters was waiting for me at the landing stage. He briefly informed me about the village and drew my attention to a low, rather pleasant-looking brick building that stood nearby. That's where he was going to take me. Do you want to put my department there? He shook his head. No, I wanted to show you something. Just go in there. Through the open door I saw a laboratory of some kind. On the experimental tables stood tripods, flasks, spirit flasks, test tubes, microscopes. In a white glass cabinet were scissors, tweezers, syringes, scalpels. I looked around and noticed glass jars that obviously held chemicals and various bottles of liquids. To top it all off, I found cages with a whole lot of white mice and guinea pigs. How did this laboratory get to the steppe village? What was its purpose? This our commandant did not know. And neither did I. And on the way to the house where the operational department was located, we met the head of the department. I told him about our discovery. He found no explanation for it and decided to assign a senior interpreter to solve the rural laboratory. The interpreter learned from an old man that the main occupation of the villagers was animal husbandry. The government had set up a laboratory for them. It was run by a woman, a veterinarian when the German troops approached. She and her assistants fled and took the cattle to safety. I passed by this small zoo-technical experimental station many times afterwards. There was always a local resident near it an old man who had stayed in the village. Obviously the security of the laboratory was organised here a proof of how much the peasants valued it. But who had time now to reflect on the fact that communism seemed to have done some good? Surprises of a very different sort, prepared for us by Soviet Russia, were soon awaiting us. On July 25th, several officers of the headquarters were sitting in the afternoon in the large tent that served as our mess tent. Nachishtaba had just gone to his quarters. And then a messenger appeared with a radiogram, which he handed to the chief of the operational department. The latter swore through his teeth, jumped up and rushed after the chief of staff. What happened? XIV tank corp, continuing the offensive down the Don, faced southwest of Kamenskoy with superior Soviet tank formations. For several hours there was a fierce battle. Here the Russians did not retreat. In the evening this was also confirmed by the XXIV tank corp, which was the day before again subordinated to the army and supported our first army corps, moving in its vanguard to the lower reaches of the Chaya. In doing so, however, it ran into a strong front of Soviet defences near Nizhny Cherskaya. Infantry divisions reported enemy resistance west of the Liski River. After various new data had been plotted on the operational map, it became apparent that the Red Army had entrenched itself south of Kalak on a vast bridgehead extending from Kamenskoye to the mouth of the Chur. Our corp made an attempt to break through the Soviet defence front and push the Red Army back behind the Don. But they ran into an insurmountable obstacle. Not only that, the Soviet divisions, 
using our weaknesses known to them, went on the counter-offensive on July 31st and threw back behind the Liska River already extremely exhausted German divisions. For several days, the 6th Army was in a precarious position. In addition, the Russians managed to cross the Don near Kremenskaya to the south and gain a foothold in the rear of the XIV Panzer Corps. He had to allocate several regiments to support the rear from the north. Now the XIV Panzer Corps stood, stretched wide, at the Don north of Kamenskoy. West of Kletskaya to the 6th Army was joined by infantry divisions, which were to replace a very slowly following us 8th Alien Army. The VIII Army Corps blocked the Soviet bridgehead from the northwest with its divisions on its right flank it kept in touch with the Lee Army Corps. The southern section from the lower chair to this point was defended by XXIV Panzer Corps. At this point the 6th Army first repulsed enemy attacks and at the same time prepared the elimination of the Soviet bridgehead. From the end of July to the beginning of August, the 8th Italian Army advanced so far that it could already replace west of Kletskaya, allocated to provide the northern flank of the divisions of the 6th Army. Some regiments of the XIV Tank Corps, sent earlier to protect the rear, freed up thanks to infantry divisions of the XI Army Corps they pushed back the enemy and equipped defensive positions. While preparations for the offensive were underway, the operations department of the 6th Army at our command post was visited by various distinguished guests. The most interesting for me was a meeting with the head of the Wehrmacht Communications Service, General Felgebel. Colonel Arnold, head of the Army Communications Service, introduced us. One evening the three of us were walking along a village street. The general started talking about the situation at the fronts. He was rather sceptical, almost pessimistic. We, too, had to feel anxious, but more often than not about individual cases, this or that episode from our army reality. Felgebel, on the other hand, doubted everything. In the west, our troops are standing, stretching from Nordcap to the Pyrenees. Rommel is fighting in North Africa. In Yugoslavia and Greece, our divisions are fighting an exhausting small war against partisans. And what happened last year near Moscow, you know yourself. Let's hope everything goes well for your army. But I can understand Paulus' displeasure at having his northern flank so stretched. As long as we don't wear ourselves out on this offensive. Several times I caught Arnold's eyes. He, like me, listened attentively to the general, who continued in an even, calm voice. Germany is again fighting a war on two fronts. You and I were eyewitnesses to this from 1914 to 1918, and we know from our own experience how much blood it cost us then, and were the circumstances more favourable for us after 1918. I allow myself to doubt that very much. I am alarmed. Yes, this is almost undisguised distrust of the military plans of the High Command, criticism of Hitler, disbelief in the victorious end. So, Felgebel does not agree with Hitler's strategy. He objected to a two-front war. And do we have any other possibility? The general turned to me. What are the losses we have suffered? Losses due to enemy action are relatively moderate. On the contrary, the number of those out of action due to illness is very high, obviously due to the unusual climatic conditions for us. The combat strength of some companies decreased by a third or more and the heaviest battles lie ahead. Prospects are far from rosy. With these words, the general concluded our conversation. It was a wonderful summer evening. In the distance in the darkening sky flashed a lightning flash. I was breathing in the fresh night air. Suddenly I felt cold. Then I noticed that I was wearing a thin summer tunic and hurried to my tent. My attendant had already set up the camp bed, and darkened the small windows. I turned on the electric light, which received power from the engine, and sat down at my desk. But the work was not going well. The words of General Felgebel pushed everything into the background, penetrated my consciousness, prevented me from thinking about anything else. But in fact, Felgebel had said only what everyone should have said after thinking everything over soberly. The next day General Felgebel left, 
None of us then did not suspect that he would later be a participant in the conspiracy against Hitler on July 20, 1944. Perhaps he was looking for allies in our headquarters and was disappointed not to find a response. But we had to go through many terrible and bitter experiences before we realized the military situation and the inhumanity and political criminality of this war. At that time, we were like in a Chad, busy preparing an offensive on the Soviet bridgehead west of Kalak. For lack of leisure, General Paulus almost had no opportunity to see his buddy Felgeable. If the commander did not have to be necessarily present at the army command post, he traveled to the front line in divisions and regiments. Paulus always tried to make his own opinion about the situation and the mood of the soldiers. Mostly, having returned from there, he was quite taciturn. He was very discouraged by the growing losses of troops before a decisive battle. Upcoming operations, the threatened position of the northern flank of the 6th Army and falling combat strength of companies, were the main topic and in conversations with Major General Schmunt, Hitler's senior adjutant. He arrived at our military airfield on a Fiesler Storch. Sometimes Paulus and Schmidt involved me in conversations with our guest. I described unvarnished the deteriorating situation with the personnel. But Schmunt had to get a direct impression of such sections of the front, which were for the Sixth Army the subject of the greatest fears. Therefore Paulus left with Schmunt to divisions in the northern section of the Bend of the Don, east of Kletskaya. Here we failed to push back the Russians behind the Don. To save forces and resources, our divisions took a cut-off position. At the command post of the 161st Infantry Regiment, 376th Division, its commander, Colonel Steidel, characterized the situation. With its left flank, the regiment was adjacent to the Italian 8th Army, which had just taken up its positions. Steidel was one of our best commanders, characterized by courage, caution, enjoyed the respect of soldiers. Paulus was familiar with him since the First World War. He knew that the colonel is not timid and in front of his superiors. Steidel really not afraid to speak in the presence of the adjutant of the Führer's Bet with a critical assessment of the threatened situation on the northern flank of the army. During the last few days, the divisional losses had again increased. In most companies, there was an average of only 25 to 35 combat-ready soldiers. Paulus later told me that Steidel insisted on replenishment. Even during the stay of Major General Schmunt Aviation reported that the Russians pulled up to the Don at Kalak reinforcements, mainly tanks. Another argument that convinced Hitler's adjutant in the need to send reinforcements as soon as possible. Spurred by the insistent demands of the Sixth Army, Schmund flew to the army group and from there back to Hitler's headquarters. Paulus escorted him to our temporary airfield and, saying goodbye, once again asked to achieve the general command of ground forces' effective support of the northern flank. Another high-ranking guest who visited us in those days was General Oxner, chief of chemical forces. For the offensive on Stalingrad, the 6th Army was to be given a brigade of special mortars. Until now, this weapon had rarely been used. I first saw it in action in 1941 during the attack on Veliki Luki. The shells flew into the air like comets with a fiery tail, emitting an unimaginable howl. Even our infantrymen, who had been shortly before trained by their commanders, ducked in fear as the rocket-like shells flew over them. They had a tremendous mental effect on an enemy caught by surprise. General Oxner stayed with us for a very short time, only one or two days. He conferred with the chief of staff on the tactical use of this formidable weapon. Parting with him, Paulus said, I hope it will not remain an empty promise. You have seen what here were merciless fighting. The enemy is not retreating under our onslaught. He resists stubbornly and retaliates wherever he can. We must get your terrifying mortar brigade at all costs. You can count on me, I will not leave you without support. Then Oxner left. Little by little we began to tire of such visitors. After all, in order to inform the visiting superiors, every time required a lot of time and effort. Now the higher authorities had enough material and information to confirm our alarming reports. 
the head of our operations department, Cole, Felter said. Schmunt returned from his trip to the front clearly shaken. He did get a kick out of what he saw with his own eyes and heard with his own ears. Hopefully he will not hide the truth from the Fuhrer, and then finally dispel the fables about the destruction of the Red Army and the enemy will begin to be taken seriously. In my opinion, I remarked, General Felgebel was the most sagacious of all. In conversation with me and Arnold, he characterised the general situation at the fronts much more deeply and soberly than I myself, even in private. I do not know how General Oxner is in the mood. We have hardly spoken to him. One can only wish that all this had finally reached the high command. As already mentioned, the Sixth Army was to cover the northern flank of the tank armies advancing to the Volga. Directive, no. 45 of July 23, 1942 gave it a new task to take Stalingrad in cooperation with the Fourth Tank Army to protect the flanks in the area from Kletskaya to the area north of Korotoyak, the Allied armies were put into action, mainly from west to east the 2nd Hungarian, 8th Italian and 3rd Romanian armies. What did we know about the Allied armies? We knew that shortly before the offensive in the summer of 1942 began to form them into separate army associations. Combat experience had only a tiny part of the troops, newly formed in the rear of Army Group South. Their equipment was insufficient. Romania and Hungary depended entirely, and Italy partially on the German military industry. What was the point of demanding that on the northern flank of the main attention to anti-tank defence, if the Allied armies completely lacked effective anti-tank means? The Romanian Panzer Division, for example, had only light Czechoslovak and French trophy tanks. Compared to the German divisions, the Allied combat power was only 50 to 60 percent. In fact, even a layman was clear these armies will never be able to resist an enemy with T-34 tanks, primarily because the Allies are poorly armed. But it was not so much the weapons as the soldiers who used them. Since 1941, Romanian divisions had been operating in offensive battles on the southern front the soldiers were brave, hardy. Most of the soldiers were peasants. As long as they fought close to the borders of their homeland, the war probably had some meaning for some Romanian soldiers. Some of them must have been tempted by the land in Bessarabia or in the territory between the Dinesta and the bug that Hitler had promised Marshal Antonescu, christening it Transnistria. Perhaps they hoped that at least there they would one day become free peasants. That was impossible in old landlord Romania. But why would a Romanian peasant soldier need land between the Don and the Volga? Besides, in the Romanian army there were such unheard of practices as physical punishment. My friend Otto Ruhl told me that he himself, even in the Stalingrad cauldron with deep indignation, not being able to intervene, once saw a Romanian officer beating and kicking a soldier. Such phenomena did not at all raise the fighting spirit of the Romanians especially it affected when they had to fight not for life but for death. General Paulus highly appreciated Romanians, with trust he treated, and to Hungarians. With Italians he fought during the First World War. He got to know them closer and in North Africa, when he conducted an inspection, being Oberquartarmeister in the general staff of the land forces. He believed that the Italian army is extremely necessary, so to speak, to tighten into a rigid corset, the role of which would play German divisions. The morale of the Italians was undoubtedly influenced by the fact that they live even farther from the Soviet Union than the Romanians and Hungarians. If from Bucharest to the Volga 1,500, and from Budapest to it 1,900 kilometres, the Romans or Milanese had to fight at a distance of almost 3,000 kilometres from their homeland. In the name of what? In the name of Great Germany? It is quite understandable that they were not too attracted by this. The reaction of the German high command to the shortcomings of the Allies was such that only increased their distrust. As mentioned above, the supply of heavy weapons and most of the equipment of the Allies depended almost exclusively on Germany. And in fact they received very little from her. But Directive No. 41 stated. 
to occupy the increasingly lengthening in the course of these operations of the front line along the Don River should be attracted primarily Allied formations, so that German troops are used as a powerful barrier between Oral and the Don River, as well as in the interfluve of the Don and the Volga near Stalingrad, but some German divisions will remain behind the front along the Don River as a mobile reserve. All this may have been the reason why the Allies were, to put it bluntly, in no hurry to take up their positions. The Second Hungarian Army, which participated in the offensive at Voronezh since July 10, provided our junction with the Second Army in the area from Novaya Kalitva and down the Don. In late July and early August, the 8th Italian Army replaced the divisions of the 6th Army on the line from Bogachar to Kletskaya. They were badly needed for the offensive on the bridgehead near Kalak. Our XVII Army Corps was attached to the 8th Italian Army. The 3rd Romanian Army was still on its way. The area assigned to it had to be temporarily occupied by Italian troops. Poorly armed and insufficiently equipped Allied troops were in addition stretched, stood far apart from each other on the Don. They did not have enough forces to reliably equip their positions. It was not a front of defence, but a thin chain of cover. This could not fail to be noticed by a very active enemy. Is it any wonder that the army command looked anxiously to the north? If the Russians exploit the weakness of our deep flank, we, Adam, will find ourselves in a more than untenable position. Look at the outline of the front. It looks like an extended fist. It's really bloody unpleasant, mister. General, one swipe of the scalpel on the wrist and the fist is cut off. Let's hope that Schmund will describe our situation truthfully at the Führer's headquarters. After all, we have told him quite clearly how things stand. Let us also hope that our allies will receive the heavy weapons they lack. But soon the most bitter disappointment befell us. For several days from the reports of air reconnaissance was known that the Russians are strengthening their bridgehead west of Kalak. The first to experience the results of this was our Lai Army Corps. Its regiments were brutally repulsed when they attacked Soviet positions east of Shurovikin. Meanwhile, the 8th Italian Army replaced still some of our divisions. They withdrew to their original positions. Infantry divisions moved to the section of the front in the northern bend of the Don from Ostrovskoye to Kletskaya, which was previously occupied by the XIV Tank Corp, giving it the opportunity to regroup for the offensive north of Kamenskoye. In the first days of August, the 76th and 295th Infantry Divisions, which had previously been part of the 17th Army, were moved to reinforce the right flank of the 6th Army. On August 6th, Preparations were completed for a powerful strike against the Soviet bridgehead. Our compounds occupied their initial lines, sufficiently supplied with ammunition and fuel. According to the reports we received, the Russians had 12 infantry divisions and five tank brigades. It was necessary to cut off their retreat across the Don. They were to be surrounded and destroyed. The operational plan provided for both tank corps to create a bridgehead on the Don XTV Tank Corps was to advance down the Don from the area of Kamenskoye and XXIV Tank Corps up the Don from the area of Nizhny Cherskaya. Early in the morning of August 7th, the ground groaned under the weight of rumbling tanks. The morning silence was immediately broken by explosions of shells and machine gun fire. Our tanks managed to break through the Soviet defence line. The head units of both corps was advancing towards each other came together in a few hours. Only then the real battle began. Our attacking infantry divisions faced a skillfully and fiercely fighting enemy. He immediately realised what danger threatened him German tanks and organised fierce counterattacks against tank corps, which fought, having in the rear of the Don. And those shot back using all their firepower. However, the Red Army units managed to break the encirclement and cross to the eastern bank of the Don. After four days of heavy fighting, the battle was over. An emergency message from the front, trumpeting a fanfare, announced that the Germans had won a major victory. 
It was silent about the fact that we had to pay dearly for it, both in men and equipment. The enemy's losses were greater. However, somewhere on the battlefield near Kalak there were also German tanks burned or put out of action. And this was especially bad for us. After all, we were at a distance of 2,000 kilometers from the rear, and the replacement could be obtained very soon. And most importantly, the Red Army won precious time to create a defense front between the Volga and the Don, on the outskirts of Stalingrad. It managed to delay the 4th Tank Army, which had already broken through the Kalmyk steppe from the Timianskaya area to the southern outskirts of Stalingrad on August 1st. By order of the general command of the land forces, the 6th Army was forced on August 12th to transfer the 24th Tank and 297th Infantry Divisions to reinforce the 4th Tank Army. Both compounds crossed the Don on the bridge at Potemkinskaya. To consolidate the success achieved at Kalak, the 6th Army was required to immediately continue the offensive on the other side of the Don. But it was unable to do so. We again lost precious time. We had to regroup formations, make up for losses in weapons and military equipment, get ammunition and fuel. The losses were mounting, and the mood was sinking. I looked through the reports on losses that came from the divisions. To those of them, which were particularly affected, I travelled to the place. Such a damaged division was the 376th Infantry, under the command of Lieutenant General Edla von Daniels. After the fighting, it concentrated with the 384th and 44th Infantry Divisions in the bend of the Don east of Kletskaya. These three divisions had the task of pushing back the Red Army troops over the Don and generally fulfilled it. It is true that later Soviet units again managed in many places to force the Don and create bridgeheads on its western bank. But even these battles cost the German troops heavy losses, for example, the number of infantry companies of the 376th Division was up to 25 men. In the 44th and 384th Infantry Divisions the situation was somewhat better. But even with the number of 35 to 40 men in the company was little reason for optimism. During the offensive of the 6th Army to the Volga River blood of German soldiers poured rivers. Gone were the easy successes of the Western Campaign, as well as the cheerful mood of the soldiers, characteristic of the summer of 1941, or for May and June 1942. During my trips in the rover I constantly met retired soldiers who were searching for their units after heavy fighting. I especially remembered two who participated in the Battle of Kalak. They served in the division to which I was going. I took them in my car. A sergeant sitting behind me still under the fresh impression of the battles he had experienced, told me. I had never been in such a scorcher even here in the east. Ivan gave us heat, we only got sparks from our eyes. Luckily our trenches are deep, otherwise there would be nothing left of us. The Russians have great artillery. It works well every shot, a direct hit on our positions, and we just squirm and dig ourselves deeper into the shit. A lot of ours have been hit by their artillery. And the biggest curse is the Katyushas. Where they hit, a man won't even have time to gasp. The comrade of the lieutenant I learned about him in the course of the conversation that he was mobilized on the eve of the matriculation exam added. And how the Soviet infantry goes on the attack. Their hurrahs almost drove me crazy. Where does this prowess and contempt for death come from? Can it be only because a commissar with a pistol in his hand is standing behind you? I think the Russians have something that we have no idea about. The sergeant took even more liberties than his comrade. He said, addressing himself directly to me. Until three weeks ago, our company officer told us as if the Red Army is finally defeated and we say, we will soon rest in Stalingrad. And it seems not quite so. On July 31st, they gave us a good beating. Our artillery and anti tank defences barely managed to stop the Russian counter offensive. Well, Mr. Colonel, will it end soon? asked the young soldier. Apparently, our strategy he did not put too high, and he might have been singing in his school as recently as six months ago Today we own Germany, and tomorrow we own the whole world.
that hops had weathered out of him instantly. Both of them were waiting for me to answer. I turned to them. I'm not a prophet, so I can't predict, but the war won't be over any time soon. You yourself have felt that the Russian can still fight. Now we must first of all take Stalingrad, and then we'll see. How's the mood in your company? Yes, how can I tell you this, mister? Colonel answered the sergeant. You won't be angry if I speak straightforwardly. The war has been going on for a long time, and our old men want to go home. Letters from there are not very cheerful either. A peasant, for example, his wife writes that her prisoner of war is a nuisance, that she can't cope with the household. And in the cities, especially in working families, food is getting worse and worse. Women do not know what to feed their hungry children. Married soldiers are worried about their loved ones, and this affects their mood. Well, and heavy losses also, of course, of course, affect. When we were walking through the battlefield on August 11th, and saw how many dead and wounded were lying there, my friend said loudly, so that everyone could hear we will all die in this cursed hopeless step. And he's a good, brave soldier. Last fall he received the Iron Cross of the First Degree. I was still immersed in thoughts about what I had just heard. As the car stopped we approached the command post of the division. Standing up straight and saying thank you very much, both soldiers left. So that's how things are in this company old men are homesick, and young men are ready to stick a bayonet in the ground after the first heavy battle. Isn't that the case in other companies as well? After I made myself an idea of the number of the division, I reported the data to the chief of staff. They were no surprise to Major General Schmidt. He knew how hard the last battles were. Formulating his point of view, he replied, the problem of replenishment is urgent. Immediately take action at the Deputy Chief of Staff, but earlier report to General Paulus. He again today all day round the divisions and probably can give you additional instructions. Paulus met me with a question. Well, Adam, what is the situation in the divisions? I have a pretty clear idea of it now. It is comforting that many of those who were reported missing have returned to their units. They had simply fallen behind. In addition, after a short hospital treatment, the lightly wounded will be sent back to their units. But what does that accomplish when company strength averages between 25 and 40 men? We have paid a dear price for our success. Heavy losses and hard fighting affect the condition of the soldiers a depressed mood prevails. I, like Major General Schmidt, believe that it is necessary to achieve replenishment as soon as possible. I absolutely agree with your assessment and with the proposed measures. All the commanders with whom I spoke the other day most insistently demand replenishment. The Russian bridgehead at Kalak proved to be a hard nut for us. Our divisions must be manned immediately. Transmit your requests by telegraph. While I was at Paulus's report, my deputy drew up requests for replenishment. Telegrams to the higher headquarters were sent out. In addition, I spoke at night by telephone with the adjutant of Army Group B, and he promised me his support. The very next day, from the rear corps director at his castle, Wiesbaden, Hanover, Vienna and Berlin received stereotypical answers prepared replenishment do not have a trained replenishment cured and recognized by medical expertise fit for service in wartime, will be urgently sent for use. Paulus was as disappointed by these answers as I was. We knew that after three years of war Germany does not have large manpower reserves, but still, after all, it was the Sixth Army that was to be the decisive striking force for the realization of the main operational goal for 1942. There was little hope for Army Group B. We could get from it only a few marching companies. We were grateful for this too, given the impending forcing of the Don. Every incoming soldier, especially shelled soldiers, mattered now. However, we needed more than two or three marching companies. After all, we had to take the largest city on the Volga. There were street battles in the city, and as we knew from our own experience, they required great sacrifices. Was it possible for our already heavy lost divisions? 
Paulus looked at me. What do you propose? Allow me, Herr General, to fly to the Führer's headquarters in Venitza. I think it's necessary to report to the chief of the organizational department about the situation with the personnel in the Sixth Army. I agree, fly out tomorrow morning. Then you can return before daylight. I will take this opportunity to put before the personnel department and the question of replenishing the officer corps. Returning to my tent, I put the documents I had prepared for the conversation in Vinitsa into my briefcase. The next morning, barely dawned, armed with the latest data on the combat composition and the list of vacant officer positions, I went to the western outskirts of the village of Osinovka, where we placed our command post. Hidden behind a clump of trees and bushes, camouflaged from aerial observation, stood the communication planes of the army headquarters. One of them was to take me to Kharkov. It was already ready to start. No sooner did I get into the car than the engine started to hum. A few minutes later the car rushed along the runway and the step, then got off the ground. We were flying at a low altitude. The sun, still low on the eastern edge of the sky, was casting a golden light on the vast step. The dewdrops on the parched grass glistened like pearls and diamonds. It was a marvellous sight, and yet I looked back warily. It was fine summer weather, and that was just what was unsafe. It offered various advantages to enemy fighters' clear visibility. The sun shone in the back, not in the eyes. In the event of an enemy raid, we'd be in trouble. The pilot did not hide my wary glance to the east. He grinned. You don't have to worry, Mr. Colonel. When our fighters are in the air, no Russian yak will come here. See those dots glinting in the sun over there? Those are ours. If the enemy shows up, they'll come at him like hawks. We were now flying backwards over the road our army had travelled in recent weeks. There was rarely a village in sight. For a very long time we flew over the highway, along which columns of cars laden with supplies were stretching eastward. The escorting convoys were waving to us. In the vast step that stretched out before us there were occasional glimpses of broken tanks, guns or overturned trucks. The lines of trenches where Germans and Russians had recently been lying against each other were clearly visible. The bodies of dead Red Army soldiers or the decomposed corpses of horses with ugly legs sticking upward often caught my eye. Down there, too, thousands of German soldiers and officers had ended their lives, the loss of which prompted me now to fly to Vinitsa. But while the Germans buried their comrades in this foreign land, no one had time to pay their last respects to the Soviet soldiers who had fought fallen in the territory we had captured. Suddenly the character of the landscape changed. We flew over the Oskol and the Donets. The villages cut into the steppe with their gardens and fields were now more crowded and larger. And then Kharkov appeared a sea of houses, a tractor factory, a high-rise building and a train station, and behind it an airfield. Having described a graceful arc, the pilot landed the car on the runway. The airplane slowly rolled up to a nearby Junkers 52, whose engine immediately started. It was a communications plane bound for Vinitsa. Our army headquarters radiated to Kharkov airfield that I was flying out of our steppe village. They were already waiting for me. In two minutes I moved from one airplane to another. Several couriers were already sitting there. There was a rumble of engines. The car was starting. It gained altitude quickly. Flying in a westerly direction, we saw a picture full of variety. Fertile Ukrainian fields stretched to the horizon, intersected by strips of forest, rivers and streams. The network of settlements was much denser than on the first stage of my air flight. Vast villages were replaced by towns and cities. Our Junkers 52 flew at an altitude of about a thousand meters. We could easily observe the columns of transport, which were moving eastward on a dense network of highways. More and more often we met trains rushing to Kharkov. They were carrying food, ammunition, fuel, weapons and equipment. Kharkov was the main supply base of Army Group B. In two hours we landed safely in Vinitsa. A passenger car took me to the city where the personnel department was located. 
There I first had a long negotiation with General von Bergsdorf. The offensive on the Don, I pointed out, had entailed particularly heavy losses among the junior infantry officers. The army group is unable to fill this gap. I understand your anxiety, replied von Bergsdorf, but at this time we can hardly help. From the other armies of Group A and B also received very large requests. We had to submit several hundred company and battalion commanders alone. Two or three weeks ago the officer training courses started, but graduation will probably be in December at the earliest. In the meantime, I can only assure you that we are in deep sympathy with the situation of the Sixth Army. But at the moment it can only be a question of individual replacements for retired officers, nothing more. That's little consolation, Mr. General. Consider whether you can't find your own resources locally in the army. See if there are any non-commissioned officers you can offer us for promotion. There may be other ways to make up for the lack of officers in the infantry. I have in mind some young enlisted men in the rear establishments. By the way, what is the situation with young personnel in the artillery and communications departments? I don't have complete data at the moment, I said. But recently the chief of our army regiment of communications complained to me that candidates for officers he has no chance of promotion. When I return to my office, I will order you to provide me with information about all the officer candidates available in the artillery and communications, but there won't be many. Having talked to the heads of departments in charge of officers of tank and engineering troops, I went to the head of the organizational department, Colonel General Staff Mueller Hillebrand. This department was also in the city, not far from the personnel department. I hope I have better luck here, I thought as I crossed the threshold of this house. As elsewhere in the Führer's headquarters, everyone who entered here was subjected to the most thorough inspection. The officer on duty read my ID card at least twice, checked the seal and signature, looked at my photograph, then at me. Then he reported my arrival to the head of the department. You have come to me on the question of replenishment. Your urgent requests are known to me, said Muller Gillibrand, greeting me. I confirmed this, gave the colonel the latest data on the number of the army, and tried as convincingly as possible to describe our plight. Before flying here, I contacted the rear corps directorates. All of them replied that at the moment to realize the required additional manning of the army cannot. Frankly speaking, we in the operational department of the Sixth Army had the impression that the rear institutions underestimate the difficulty of the task set before us. How can you take a major city, occupying an area of about 300 square kilometers, if the combat strength of the company 30 to 40 people? Based on our recent experience in a large bend of the Don, we should expect that the enemy will defend every house, every stone. The head of the organizational department was leafing through my documents. I looked at him with hope. You know how things are with us, and believe me, I would gladly help you. Unfortunately, however, everything is really the way it is, as the heads of the rear departments have informed you. The new replenishment of conscripts will be trained only by the end of the year. Until January 1943, there is nothing to count on replenishment of infantry regiments. I looked at Müller Hillebrand in horror. After all, the attack on Stalingrad should begin now, not in January 1943. What will happen to us? if the combat strength of our units does not reach even half. The colonel noticed my confusion. Tell your commander that I will do everything to help you. True, in the coming months we will have only soldiers who were discharged from hospitals as cured. I will see to it that the marching companies formed from them are sent first to the Sixth Army. I'm extremely sorry I can't promise you anything more. I take my leave. Never once during the whole war had I been so heavy at heart as now, when I was going back to the army headquarters with almost empty hands. I got there at the very last minute in time for the airplane flying to Kharkov. It was almost packed with couriers, Sonderführers, Wehrmacht employees, commanders of frontline army units who were returning from vacation or combat training courses. The seat was reserved for me just behind the cockpit.
There was a lively conversation going on around. But I did not listen. I could not overcome the deep apathy that seized me after all the trials of the day. Did the Wehrmacht High Command and the General Staff of the Land Forces really thought it possible to carry out an offensive at a distance of 650 plus kilometres without significant losses to us? Army Group B managed, however, to encircle and destroy a large number of Soviet troops. The enemy, however, was retreating behind the Don and will undoubtedly still give us a lot of trouble in the upcoming battles for Stalingrad. But how can you plan a war, setting huge strategic goals, and yet forget about the timely replenishment of manpower, weapons and equipment? Every military school teaches that the breakthrough of a well-fortified enemy defence strip requires significant sacrifices from the offensive, if only the breakthrough at all succeeds. Already in World War I, the Russians showed examples of skill in defence. Has the general command of the land forces forgotten this? Should we not have taken urgent action as soon as the first reports of heavy losses were received from our advancing armies? Did we not inform Hitler's chief adjutant, General Schmund, and Generals Felgebel and Ochsner of the losses in advance, and warn them most emphatically that if we were not replenished, the threatened situation was imminent? We had heard only words of promise, but nothing had been done. Now I was particularly tormented by the thought of how irresponsibly the High Command was underestimating the Soviet troops. What will happen now if in the coming battles our losses will increase? Are there any reserves at all on our thousand-kilometre front that could close possible gaps? I had not thought of any way out of the situation when the plane landed at the Kharkov airfield. At that time there was great excitement here. Transport planes travelling in various directions were standing by. A pilot from our squadron was waiting for me. We immediately took off, and by evening we were in Osinovka. Right from the airfield I went to General Paulus. He was stooped and pale from sleepless nights. Previously so straight and slender, now he seemed hunched over. I sensed how hard it was for this man to bear the burden of responsibility. Well, Adam, what have you accomplished at the stake? Without wasting unnecessary words, I reported the sad results of the flight to Vinitsa, trying not to show my excitement and disappointment. Oh, that's how it is. I must take Stalingrad with exhausted divisions, said Paulus bitterly. When I finished my report, Muller-Gillebrand assured me that the incoming marching companies will be sent mainly to our army. Of course, this is not enough, but I must assume that the General Command of Land Forces will take care at least to replace our exsanguinated divisions, if there is no sufficient replenishment. I myself did not believe in this possibility, but I wanted to say something that would not darken the already gloomy situation. But Paulus was not inclined to be deceived. No, Adam, it's not realistic. Where will these divisions come from? We have already repeatedly talked about reserves. Hitler doesn't even want to know about it. Apparently, the plan for this offensive was already at its core a product of frivolity and overthinking. We therefore have nothing to reproach us. We did everything that was in our power. From the very first day of the offensive, we gave true information. You know I've never been inclined to underestimate the enemy. I did not stop myself from giving my warnings in the presence of Schmunt and Felgebel and all the others. I can certify this with a pure heart and a clear conscience, Herr General. The fighting at Kalak has shown us that the Russians no longer intend to give up territory without a struggle. Our soldiers, as a result of the physical and mental strain required of them in recent days and weeks, are exhausted, weapons and equipment are largely out of service. And now the exhausted troops, who have not had a day's rest for seven whole weeks, must go on the offensive again. It is because I know all this, mister. General, I in Venitsa described our situation in the darkest colours. Paulus thought for a moment, then continued. General Blumentritt, my successor in the post of first Oberquartarmeister in the general staff, is now travelling as an inspector of the Eastern Front. He has let me know that he will be with me. I'll tell him everything again. If there is any way to help us at all, he will surely do it. Saying goodbye to Paulus, I hurried to the chief of staff, who was already waiting for me.
I knew that Schmidt is not easy to pierce, but when he listened to my brief report, he still exploded. Our infantry has passed with battles more than 500 kilometers. Apparently, the gentleman from the General Command of Land Forces forgot what that means. A bow that's too tight is bound to break. But in spite of everything, Adam, let's not hang our heads. I trust our brave soldiers. Sure, they grumble. But when the order to advance comes, they will march forward again. I'm convinced we'll accomplish our goal. Do you think, Mr. General, that the coming battles will bring us fewer casualties? No, I don't. In any case, we have prepared for the crossing of the Don two divisions with almost normal strength 76th and 295th. I've given them their last marching battalions. The commanders can be relied on. Besides, you have probably already heard from the commander that General Blumentritt is coming to us. We'd like to talk to him straight again. General Blumentritt has arrived at the command post of the Army Operations Department. The last preparations for the forcing of the Don and the attack on Stalingrad were over. Divisions stood at their original positions. Paulus and Schmidt once again discussed in detail with General Blumentritt offensive operations. Army commander stressed that success can be guaranteed only if there will be excluded any threat to the northern flank of 400 kilometers. Thus, Blumentritt received a very instructive impression of the threatening situation in which we were. On August 19th, the corps of the 6th Army was ordered to attack. In the afternoon, I reported to Major General Schmidt. In his office hung highly enlarged aerial photographs of Stalingrad. Now, for the first time, I got a clear idea of this city, which was indicated on our maps by a small circle. It occupied on the western bank of the Volga a strip of four to seven kilometers wide and over 60 kilometers long. I had no idea that this city was of such a huge size. It begged the question, will we be able to storm this huge city? After all, the enemy knows our intentions. Even when we fought near Kaluk, the Russians, as our pilots reported, built several defensive belts with anti-tank ditches. While we were regrouping our forces after that, they won another two weeks. Despite the reinforcements received XXIV Tank Corps and 297th Infantry Division, the 4th Panzer Army was unable to break through to the Volga south of Stalingrad. Consequently, our current offensive will not come as a surprise to the Soviet command at all. That is, of course, true. But if we still break through here, concentrating tanks at the northern outskirts of Stalingrad, and the 4th Tank Army will simultaneously develop the offensive from the south, the enemy will have to fight on both flanks, standing one from the other at a distance of about 60 kilometers. Whether he will be able to do this, in my opinion, very doubtful. We've thought of all the options. Ammunition and fuel are available in sufficient quantities. The Red Army Command has undoubtedly used the past nearly four weeks to bring in reinforcements, remove factory equipment, evacuate the population and prepare the city for a prolonged defense. This promises us fierce, fierce fighting. However, I am convinced that we will take ours, and soon. Listening to Schmidt, and indeed it seemed that our operational department positively considered everything. We foresaw heavy and probably bloody battles. But in the end, we will achieve victory. I signed in receipt of the offensive order and went to my tent to thoroughly study this document. Mentally, I still saw before me aerial photographs of the city on the Volga. Stalingrad is of great strategic importance. It serves as a link between the Caucasus and central Russia. If this city is in German hands, the enemy will be cut off from the breadbasket Cuban and oil fields between the Caspian and Black Seas. One of the most important arteries will be cut in the most important place. But what will happen if we fail to take the city from the start? Reconnaissance of the terrain showed that the best initial area for the offensive of the 6th Army at Stalingrad is the bend of the Don between Mukinskoye and Ostrovskoye. Here the western bank is overgrown with forest. Dense shrubbery and deep ravines crossing the steep bank of the Don and descending to the river provided excellent camouflage. 
they allowed unnoticed for the enemy to pull up directly to the river all the means necessary for forcing the river and building crossings for tanks. In addition, from the occupied by us western bank at a distance of many kilometres well viewed more lowland plain to the east of the river. At the command post Paulus explained to the Corp as commanders of the offensive plan. He envisioned to create on both sides of Vertikaki bridgehead on the east bank of the Don by Lai Army Corps, as well as 295th and 76th Infantry Division, so that from this bridgehead XIV Panzer Corps could go to the Volga River north of Stalingrad. After breaking through the enemy's defensive line, Lai Army Corp was to take over the provision of the right and VIII Army Corps the left flank of the tanks advancing to the Volga. XI Army Corp was to remain to ensure the flanks in the bend of the Don between Malo Kletskoy and Kletskaya XXIV Tank Corps, which took away the 24th Tank and 297th Infantry Division, which now had only 71st Infantry Division, was to create by the forces of this division bridgehead at Kalaka and from there to advance eastward. For the past ten days, the operations department of the army headquarters resembled a beehive. Liaison officers came and went, reports were reviewed and evaluated, corpus commanders came to the headquarters for personal talks, pilots reported on their observations, one meeting after another. Now came a calm, filled with expectation. What will tomorrow bring? This question was the main topic of our table conversations on August 20th. I cannot imagine, said the Chief of Operations, that the crossing will require great sacrifice. Positions of the enemy on our side are well viewed, our artillery shot, infantrymen and sappers instructed. After a short artillery preparation assault boats will cross the Don. By the time the enemy recovers we'll be on the other bank. If everything goes smoothly, yes I objected. But if our artillery does not suppress all the enemy's machine gun nests, the crossing may cost great sacrifices. Two days ago, one of the divisional adjutants, who was himself on the front line, then told me that the enemy has excellently camouflaged his positions. It is particularly difficult to locate machine gun nests placed just off the beach. Schmidt remarked. Do not worry, gentlemen, it will not be easy, but we will cope with the task. With that, Schmidt bade us farewell. I had long been planning to visit two old regimental comrades who were in the 76th Infantry Division. How do I know if I will ever see them again after the coming battles? So I asked Major General Schmidt to allow me to go to the 76th Division as early as today. Of course you may go, Adam. Give my regards to General Rodenberg and tell him break a leg for me. Arrange your trip so you'll be back before daylight. I had to hurry. Fifteen minutes later I was already on the road in a passenger all-terrain vehicle. Despite the fact that the roads were broken we moved quickly. The black dust, which was raised by motorised vehicles, was a great hindrance on the way. Overtaking a column of trucks, we were immersed in a thick cloud. The driver drove slowly at first, but soon the windshield was covered with such a thick layer of dust that he had to stop to wipe it off with a rag. I laughed involuntarily when he looked through the clear glass his face was as black as the nave. But the driver was no less amused and offered me a look in the mirror. Turns out I didn't look any better. Dust had gotten into the car through every crevice. Even the engine was covered with a centimetre layer of dust. Further progress was almost impossible, so we turned off the highway and followed the compass straight through the step. Many times, bumping into rivers, we had to go back to the road on which the columns were advancing in order to reach the crossing. Here reigned an unimaginable crowd. Dozens of ammunition columns were striving to reach the artillery positions before dark. Cubelli and horse-drawn transport hastily moved forward. Between them snuck liaison motorcyclists. Motors, horses and men were making an incredible noise. 76th Infantry Division before the advance between 3 and 4 p.m. I arrived at the command post of the 76th Infantry Division. It was posted in a grove immediately behind the regiment's starting positions. In front of the tent, on the edge of the forest, stood the desk of the division commander, 
Behind it sat Major General Rodenberg, leaning over a map on which the offensive strip was marked and the lines of attack were outlined. Beside him stood his chief of operations, Lieutenant Colonel Breitgaupt. I told my driver to pull up to the table itself. The Lieutenant Colonel went to meet us in anger, who is it that dares to come so close by car? But when he recognised me, he was unusually happy. We had not seen each other since the fall of 1936. Then we both commanded companies in the same battalion in Gießen and Worms. I always found common ground with Breakopt, who was the son of a peasant and a native of Thuringia. Rodenberg greeted me. It is good of you, Adam, to visit us once. We have often remembered you. If you had arrived an hour earlier, you would have caught General Paulus. He came from the 295th Division and had a long talk with us. Well, was the commander satisfied? I asked. I think so, answered Breitgopt. He demanded that we reported to him in detail how we intend to attack. He approved our orders. Then I accompanied him to the location of the infantry regiments, which took the initial lines of attack, and at the end he visited the observation post of the artillerymen. How do you estimate the prospects? Will there be success, Mr. General? As you know, I am an optimist. Our preparations have certainly not gone unnoticed by the enemy. But we are up to the task. Until now, I have always been able to rely on my Brandenburgers. Breitgaupt added. Paulus talked to the sappers. Everything is prepared. As soon as we repel the enemy on the opposite bank, the sappers will immediately begin to put the crossing. Before the bridge is ready, anti-tank units and artillery will move after the infantry on pontoons. Artillery observers will go with the first advancing echelon. We think that everything should go well and the strong enemy resistance will be broken. I knew Breitgopt six or eight years self-confident, optimistic. He was not afraid and the most difficult task. How's the mood in the troops, Breitgopt? Oh, that's what's worrying you. Paulus asked me the same question. What can I tell you? You want to visit a Bragham's regiment? You'll see for yourself what the mood is like. We're satisfied with the soldiers. I had to go to Abraham. I wanted to get to our command post before dark. After bidding farewell to Rodenberg and Breitgaupt, I set out, but one thought kept me in suspense would everything go as smoothly as Rodenberg and Breitgaupt expected. Of course Breitgaupt is a good man, but the enemy knows what awaits him. He must not have been idle. I was accompanied by the regimental liaison, assigned to the division headquarters, a lively young man with sparkling eyes. I asked him, Well, how are things in your regiment? We hope. The soldier answered readily that now everything will go full speed and we will finally get to Stalingrad. We have travelled enough on the steppe and we are glad that a long rest awaits us. Everyone is fed up with the steppe. We can't find any real accommodation here. It was much better in France, that's where everyone would love to return to. Will you manage to make it all the way to Stalingrad? Our regiment, Mr. Colonel, has never retreated before. We've got a lot of old soldiers back with the latest reinforcements. They're a bit rowdy, but they do their job when they have to. Many of them have been wounded more than once. They are dashing front-line soldiers. Our colonel can rely on them. Good, then everything should go smoothly for you. Over there, mister. Colonel, the regiment's command post. The soldier pointed to a young forest not far from us. Abraham was already waiting for me. Breitgopt had let him know of my arrival. We hadn't seen each other since the beginning of the war. As I greeted him, I noticed that he hadn't changed much. But maybe I thought he greeted me coldly. Well, Adam, I thought the army adjutant had forgotten his old comrades. But you know what we've been going through the last few weeks. Only today, before the offensive began, it got quieter and I immediately took this opportunity to visit my old friends. I was only joking, my dear Abraham replied. I am very glad to see you at last. 
It would be nice if we had one of the many bottles we emptied in Trier, but in this parched steppe, even drinking water is scarce. We set off through a sparse forest towards the dawn. Not a single soldier was in sight. Only the signposts testified that dozens of units were stationed here at the original frontiers. Wires hung from tree branches, mortars were camouflaged in the shrubbery. Coming out of the woods, we came across a small wooden shield mounted on a tree. The inscription on it read Observation Post of the Regimental Commander. The arrow pointed the way to the way to the Don, and we walked along a deep ravine. It goes straight down to the river, Abraham explained. It's one of the gullies created by erosion, a so-called gully. I've heard of it. But today is the first time I've seen what a gully like this looks like. It's amazing what kind of work the water has done. You could probably fit a whole company in here. More than that. There's room for at least two companies in this gully. There's half a dozen gullies like this on my property alone. The observation post was hidden in the dense shrubbery. Further on the ground steeply steepened at the dawn, in its dark waves reflected the evening sun. I looked at the other bank, there lay the steppe. Beyond it somewhere far away was a large city on the Volga. Through the stereo tube I tried to see the enemy's location. Are there any Russians there at all? I asked Abraham. Of course, but they are so well camouflaged that almost nothing can be seen. During the day there is no movement at all on the shore. Meanwhile there are machine gun nests there. We tried to tempt them with convenient targets, but they don't even turn a deaf ear. Not a single shot has been fired from that side, even at night, when the enemy is somewhat animated. We've got some machine gun nests. Look through the stereo telescope. Can you see a machine gun nest in the crosshairs? It took me at least ten seconds before I recognized a machine gun nest. When I turned to Abraham again, I thought the expression on his face had changed. Gone was the ironic crease near his mouth. His lips were firmly pressed together. His eyes looked at me seriously, almost point blank. If our heavy guns do not completely suppress the enemy positions, crossing the river will cost us very expensive. We agreed in detail on the coordination of artillery, mortars and sappers. Nevertheless, much was left unsaid. I would put the anti-personnel guns as far forward as possible, so that it would be possible to fire direct fire when the enemy appeared. This is done, as you can see for yourself. But I am interested in something else added the regimental commander. What is the situation with the replenishment, which of course will be needed after the upcoming battles? That's what is unclear. The new recruits will be trained only in December. We have to hope for the best. Evening came. In fact, it was about time to head back. But Abraham wanted to show me the artillery positions. I had to admit the regiment had taken the matter seriously. The guns were well camouflaged with a wide, unobstructed field of fire in front of them. The trenches for servants, ammunition, the placement of the four parts, everything was done in strict accordance with the battle regulations. Abraham told me that the soldiers were visibly tired and exhausted. They grumble at times. But what infantryman doesn't give his mood a little vent every now and now and then? How's your health, Abraham? Not good. The regimental doctor wanted to put me in the hospital for a few days. I refused, of course. What would it look like for a commander to abandon his regiment to its fate before an offensive? What exactly are you ill with? My nerves aren't right. The doctor wants to refer me to a specialist. I hardly sleep at all. That's why I feel wrecked during the day. But now we must first of all cross the dawn. Let me know immediately if you feel worse. If you fall off, you'll be of no use to anyone, neither yourself nor the troops. So break a leg tomorrow. It was quite late when I set off on my return journey. Will we reach our command post by daylight? I asked the chauffeur. I don't think so, Mr. Colonel. The sun has already set, and night comes at once here. 
I wish we could get to the rear highway before nightfall. We must pass to the west of this village, I showed on the map lying on my lap. Again, a cloud of dust enveloped us. Now we could see even worse than during the day on the way to the division. Besides, we were now moving against the current, toward the trucks, field kitchens, and horse-drawn transport that were heading for the front line. Forced to stop every now and then, we were barely crawling, and I fell into deep thought. The chauffeur brought me back to reality. Mr. Colonel, I think we're lost. It's high time we got on the highway. What the hell? The hands on the luminous face of my wristwatch showed half past nine. It was getting dark. The oncoming traffic had stopped and I hadn't even noticed. I ordered a stop. We were on a road covered with steppy grass. We were going to regimental headquarters by another road. So we got lost and got on a blind road. We had to turn around. In five minutes we found ourselves at a crossroads. With the help of a pocket flashlight I tried to find a trace of our car. But in vain there were car tracks everywhere. Suddenly not far from us, white flares flew into the air. Using a compass I determined that the flares were to the east of us. Therefore there is the front line, and we found ourselves on the road that runs along the Don. I ordered the driver to drive in a northerly direction hoping in this way to get back on the highway a light shone in the distance, and we moved towards it. It was the headlights of a car that had been involved in an accident. Two soldiers from the supply department of the 76th Infantry Division were standing by the car. They confirmed that we were now driving correctly. After a kilometre and a half we found ourselves on the highway and slowly moved on. At eleven o'clock in the evening we arrived at our command post in Osinovka. We were already worried about us, as the 76th Infantry Division had reported my departure. Now I had no time to sleep. I told about my impressions. Paulus was also satisfied with his trip. We decided that all the prerequisites for the success of the future offensive have been created. It was two o'clock in the morning. Putting out the light, I laid down on a camp bunk. Through the open window flowed fresh night air. The pale light of the moon illuminated my room. Could it be daylight? I looked at the clock half past three. There were sixty minutes to go. Anxiety gripped me. I went to the chief of operations. The liaison officers of the operations department were already there. By phone again checked the time with the corp headquarters. At that moment Paulus appeared. Exactly at the appointed hour gun thunder broke the silence of the passing night. That was the overture to the offensive across the Don. After a massive fire attack, the floating means of infantrymen and sappers were launched. Smoking a cigarette, Paulus sat at the table with operational maps. His face twitched. Like everyone else, he was excited. What would the first reports bring? The chief of operations headed for the telephone exchange. He had constant communication with the army corps that was in the vanguard of the offensive. It seemed like an eternity before he finally returned. The talking stopped. Mr. General received the first report Lie Army Corps. The 295th Infantry Division has crossed the Don and is advancing. Casualties are insignificant. From the 76th Infantry Division it was reported that only one regiment had forced the Don. The attack of the 2nd Infantry Regiment was repulsed with heavy losses. Many of the floating means were out of service. The Corp commander went to the 76th Infantry Division. What measures took the Corps to help the regiment? Paulus asked. The report was transmitted through the liaison officer. At the moment I do not know the details, but I will immediately order that I was contacted with the Chief of Staff of the Corps. There was a confused silence in the room. Probably what Abraham had told me the day before on the steep bank of the Don had happened. If our heavy guns do not completely overwhelm the enemy's positions, crossing the river will cost us many casualties. The first liaison officer entered the room and reported. The 76th Infantry Division reported through Lai Army Corps the reasons for the failure of the regiment advancing on the right. 
When the first wave of the advancing two-thirds of the way across the river, a hurricane fire was opened on them from perfectly camouflaged machine guns and mortars. The regiment suffered serious losses. The floating means were sunk. Only a few soldiers managed to swim back. The Corp commander ordered the 295th Infantry Division, attacking the enemy from the rear, to clear the opposite bank in front of the right wing of the 76th Infantry Division. Paulus was in agreement with the Corp orders. He ordered the liaison officer, let the Corp report when the regimental attack will be repeated. Officers of the army headquarters dispersed to their places. Soon came the news that the ill-fated infantry regiment successfully resumed the offensive. The enemy was bypassed from the rear. Thus, both divisions of the Lee Corps managed to create a bridgehead on the east bank of the Don, which could be quickly expanded, despite the strong counterattacks of the enemy. Meanwhile, the sappers were making bridges with feverish speed. For the XIV tank corps, which was to make its way to the Volga, bridges at Peskovatka and Vertiki were moved. Volga Don Interfluv. On August 23rd, the 16th Panzer Division, as well as the 3rd Infantry and 60th Motorized Divisions, went on the offensive from the Don bridgehead. Early in the morning they broke through the enemy's defensive line and through a chain of hills north of the boundary Malaya Rossushka Height 137 Connie connector made their way to the Volga River, which they reached by the evening of the same day at rink north of Stalingrad. This offensive created a corridor 60 kilometers long and 8 kilometers wide. It happened so quickly that infantry divisions could not keep up, could not prevent Soviet units from cutting off the XIV tank corps. As a result of fierce counterattacks, especially on the uncovered flanks, the corpus was in an extremely difficult position. It had to be supplied by airplanes and columns of trucks guarded by tanks. Loaded with wounded vehicles under the cover of tanks broke through the fighting order of the Russians in the direction of the Don. On the bridgehead the wounded were handed over and there they received food. The vehicles escorted by tanks returned to the corps. However, the XIV tank corps did not manage to capture the northern part of the city. For many days, isolated from the main forces of the 6th Army, it fought heavy defensive battles, taking a circular defence. Only in a week after the transfer of new infantry divisions to the bridgehead it was possible to break the enemy resistance and restore communication with the tank corp. VII Army Corps covered the northern flank in the area between the Volga and the Don. In the army order this area was called Land Bridge. The VII Army Corp field headquarters followed directly behind the advancing divisions. The quartermaster with his staff also crossed the Don and camped in tents not far from the newly built bridge at Peskovatka. The bridge was a target of Soviet aviation at night. This had fatal consequences for the supply headquarters. At the end of August, late at night, the adjutant of the VII Army Corps was reported to me by telephone that an hour earlier an aerial bomb had hit the tent in which the quartermaster had gathered the officers of his headquarters for a meeting. The quartermaster and several officers were killed, the rest seriously or slightly wounded. The Corps asks for replacements immediately, as otherwise the supply will be jeopardised. Before reporting this by telephone to Paulus and Schmidt, I instructed our liaison officers to connect me with the adjutant of Army Group B. No sooner had I informed both our generals than the telephone rang again, called from the group of armies. Duty officer took a report and an urgent request for replenishment. The requested officers arrived the next day. But it did not stop there. The Russians without respite attacked the VIII Army Corps. Heavy losses were suffered in the fighting south of Kotlubani. Lee Army Corps course also reported increasing losses. It was to cover the right flank of the XIV Tank Corp to attack Stalingrad in the direction of Rosushka Gomrak. However, the Corp was slowly moving forward. Counterattacks of the Red Army from the side of the Rosushka River Valley forced the Corps for many days to go on the defence. The same happened with the 71st Infantry Division, however, on August 25th. It crossed the Don at Kalak, but immediately got stuck. 
nor did the Fourth Tank Army, which was to take possession of the southern part of Stalingrad, reach its goal. Soviet troops fought for every inch of ground. Almost implausible seemed to us the report of General of the Tank Forces von Wittersheim, commander of the XIV Tank Corps. While his corp was forced to fight in the encirclement, from there came scant news. Now the general reported that the Red Army units counterattacked, supported by the entire population of Stalingrad, showing exceptional courage. This is expressed not only in the construction of defensive fortifications, and not only in the fact that factories and large buildings have been turned into fortresses. The population has taken up arms. On the battlefield lie dead workers in their overalls, often clutching a rifle or pistol in their stiffened hands. Dead men in work clothes froze, leaning over the steering wheel of a wrecked tank. Nothing like this we had ever seen before. General von Wittersheim suggested to the commander of the Sixth Army to move away from the Volga. He did not believe that it will be possible to take this giant city. Paulus rejected his proposal, as it was in contradiction with the order of Army Group B and the High Command. Between both generals there was a serious disagreement. Paulus believed that the general who doubts the final success is not suitable to command in this difficult situation. He proposed to the Army High Command to remove General von Wittersheim and named as his successor Lieutenant General Hube, who commanded the 16th Panzer Division. This proposal was accepted. The very next day a letter was received from the General Staff of the Land Forces to General von Wittersheim in a sealed envelope. I was instructed to fly on a Fiesler Storch to the command post of the Tank Corps and hand the package to the General against signature. Wittersheim was with his Chief of Staff in the headquarters bus, which stood in the steppe. I met the General for the first time. He was a tall, slender man, reserved, perfectly in command of himself. His hair was already greying. Keeping his composure, he took the letter from me, sat down in the corner of the car and opened the envelope. I took a seat near the entrance, next to the Chief of Staff. Before my flight, Paulus told me that von Wittersheim and his Chief of Staff hold the same point of view. What was going on in the General's soul now? We didn't dare to look back. But he approached us with a firm step. Here, Adam. Here's a receipt for the letter. He noticed my embarrassment and added, It's not always pleasant to be an adjutant to an army. He must have gotten over himself. His voice did not give away his excitement. Turning to his chief of staff, he said, Summon General Hube, have him report to me today. When I, having said goodbye, left the staff bus, von Wittersheim shouted to me in pursuit, Give my regards to General Paulus. Fiesler Storch was standing there. The pilot turned on the engine. There was a growing rumble of the propeller, which rotated faster and faster, raising dust and shreds of grass. After a short run-up we were off the ground and flew back to the Army Command Post. I was troubled by contradictory feelings and thoughts, but still I was in agreement with Paulus. Certainly he had not acted lightly when he proposed to suspend von Wittersheim. After all, Wittersheim had doubts about success. Such a point of view was unacceptable to Paulus, as he believed that both advancing armies will be able to seize Stalingrad. But here we crossed the Don. The plane began to land and rolled up to the southern outskirts of Golubinsky, where the new command post settled. Appearing at Paulus, I handed him the receipt of Wittersheim and gave him my regards. How did he take the news, Adam? The general read the letter in silence. He, as if nothing had happened, ordered the chief of staff to summon Hube to the command post. I was impressed by his composure. What does the future hold for Wittersheim, General? He'll probably get another assignment. Well, he's a capable general, but his nerves have changed here. I can't suspend the offensive, because the first tank corps offensive on the city has collapsed. With Hube we will not have any difficulties. He is a brave and determined man, the ideal tank commander. However, the position of the corp is still dangerous. The Army Corps, which was supposed to help the tankers, 
ran into strong resistance to the Russians and for many days has been restrained. Tomorrow I am going with General von Seidlitz to the 295th Infantry Division. It would be good if you could join us. That division has suffered some heavy casualties. We must think of ways to make up for them. Of course I'll go with you, Mr. General. I had some urgent papers waiting for me in the staff room. I quickly went through them, handed them out to the staff and went to the head of the operations department to familiarize myself with the new situation. He informed me that since yesterday no significant changes have occurred. In the north, the Russians are continuously attacking in the Interfluve. VIII Army Corps and XIV Tank Corps are fighting hard defensive battles. Lee Army Corp is restrained. In the same position, 71st Infantry Division. The 4th Air Army since August 23rd has been continuously bombarding the city. Stalingrad a continuous sea of fire. Thick black clouds of smoke indicate that the bombs hit the oil tanks. The 4th Tank Army has shifted the direction of the main blow to the left flank and thus strikes at the deep flank of the enemy opposing us. Let's hope that this attack will change the situation. I checked my data with the operational map, made the necessary corrections and returned to my place. The nights became cold, and a few days ago I moved from the tent to a house on the southern outskirts of Golubinsky. Slowly I returned to my place. It was already late. Almost full moon was casting its milky light on one-story whitewashed houses and picturesque gardens of a clean Cossack village. About in the middle of the village there was a single two-storied building a school, which housed the chief of the army engineering service with his staff. From here the road went to the high bank and further joined the highway, which stretched along the Don to the south, past Kalak, to the station of Chur and from there to the station of Nizhny Cherskaya. Golubinsky was in the centre between Kalak in the south and Peskovatka in the north. If we wanted to go by car or motorcycle to the divisions of the Volga front, we had to first take the highway through the Pridden Hills, along the Don to the pontoon bridges. After dark on this main highway began especially busy traffic. The hum of engines broke the silence of our command post. Suddenly I heard someone cursing, calling for help from all the saints. A thin beam of a pocket flashlight flashed in the distance. Probably some kind of accident again, I thought. It was a nuisance at this hour. Regularly at ten o'clock in the evening a Russian duty pilot appeared with his sewing machine. From a low altitude the pilot of the little biplane would drop bombs from his board on targets he had spotted. Just recently, as a result of this raid, was seriously wounded a young officer of our headquarters, who did not consider it necessary to take cover in the trench and today the plane arrived according to schedule. Golubinsky he this time left alone. Probably the pilot's attention was attracted by the lights on the highway. There was an explosion. Toward me walked an officer in a steel helmet. It was the duty officer who checked the night guards at the exits from the city, at the commander's house and in front of the headquarters services. He reported back to me. Is everything all right? I asked. That's right, mister. Colonel, no complaints. The sewing machine spared us this time. We must teach soldiers to carefully observe camouflage. But a bomb must have fallen on the highway. Let's hope nothing serious happened there. I'll know soon. The commandant is waiting for the return of the car that took the vacationers to Cheer Station. Send a liaison motorcyclist from our duty team to the highway. Maybe we need medical help. Report to me if there's any emergency. Yes, mister. Colonel. The next morning about six o'clock I drove along the Pradonskoy Highway to the bridge at Peskovatka. The VIII Army Corp was there. For many days now Red Army formations had been raining down on its divisions. The losses in killed and wounded were rapidly increasing. Corpus Commander Artillery General Gitz met me with the words. You must help us with replenishment and immediately. If the Russians will be so annoying to us, we will not be able to provide a successful defence.
although we are doing everything to reduce losses, strengthening at least our positions. We are doing everything in our power, Mr. General. But so far we have not achieved much, I answered and told him about my flight to Vinitsa. The prospects are bad. Nothing remains but to scour the headquarters and rear units. Paulus instructed me to drive from Peskovatka to the command post of the 295th Infantry Division. He himself was going to fly there on a Fiesler Storch. I bade farewell to General Getz and moved towards Stalingrad. After about half an hour I saw a command post in the steppe. There stood two Fiesler Storch and several vehicles. Paulus was already there and talking with the commander of the Lee Army Corps, General von Seidlitz, the division commander, Lieutenant General Woodman and some air general, whom I saw for the first time. That was Colonel General von Richefen, commander of the 4th Air Army. Its compounds of bombers and fighters supported the offensive at Stalingrad. Their activity was evidenced by thick black clouds of smoke that covered the horizon after August 23rd. From the command post of the 295th Infantry Division I first saw these clouds of smoke rising into the sky. The city itself was hidden by the high ground. The contrast between the beauty of nature and the devastation of war was striking. On this beautiful late summer day the whole area was bathed in sunlight, but from the west, accompanied by nimble fighter planes, squadrons of bombers were flying incessantly, dropping their deadly cargo on the city accompanied by deafening thunder and clouds of smoke. And it's been like this all day, said the officer Sapper. There's probably not much left of the city. One must suppose that the bombs falling in hail destroy all living things. Paulus watched a few minutes this horrifying spectacle. Then he ordered the division commander to report on the progress of the offensive. Over the past few days we are very slowly moving forward. The Russians are fighting fiercely. They are using every knoll for defence, and not an inch is not given up without a fight. Our losses are increasing with every step we take towards Stalingrad. Our offensive impulse is drying up. During the report of General Woodman, I stood at a distance with the division liaison officer. This officer supplemented his commander's report by noting, The heavy losses are depressing to the soldiers. The men are downcast, they did not expect such stubborn resistance. They thought that in a few days they would be in the city and finally be able to rest. But now most of the soldiers consider it very doubtful that we will ever take Stalingrad. We have to seriously fight against such sentiments. The division approached the Don, numbering about 13,000 men. After a few days of fighting, barely half of its personnel survived. Even General von Seidlitz, who was known as a stern and fearless commander, did not hide his anxiety about the future prospects of the offensive. Even in the morning, during a conversation with General Heitz, I had the idea that it is necessary to fly again to the headquarters of Hitler. It became clear that there was no other way out. Paulus agreed to this proposal. After Major General Schmidt approved my proposal, I from the command post by telephone asked the personnel office in Vinitsa to receive me the same day. The head of my office, Senior Field Febel Kupper, prepared for me an overview of the personnel of all divisions. To this he added reports from artillery and communications units on the number of available candidates for officer positions. Nearly 200 men could not be promoted for lack of regular positions. I suggested that about 80 of them should be sent to infantry courses near the front for retraining. Paulus and Schmidt were in agreement with this. To the petition for permission to organise such courses, signed by the army commander, was attached to the programme of training and retraining I drew up together with the head of the operations department. Coincidentally, the same day, along with the current mail arrived the order to send me in the second half of September for treatment at the sanatorium Falkenstein. Schmidt grumbled as he read the paper. They could have chosen a more appropriate moment for your treatment. Have a word with the personnel office tomorrow regarding your deputy. It is necessary that he be sent here as early as possible to familiarise himself with the cases, otherwise you will not be able to leave on the scheduled date. After dinner, Paulus's son-in-law, 
Sonderfuhrer Baron von Kutschenbach, the interpreter of the army staff, asked me to talk to him. What could be troubling him? We began to walk along the village street. I am worried about my father-in-law, so began the conversation von Kutschenbach. You know as well as I do that he and Schmidt do not get on well together. If the matter has not yet come to an open rupture, it is only because my father-in-law is always inferior to him. Schmidt's arrogance and self-confidence disgust him. He is upset that the chief of staff and the heads of departments treat each other unfriendly. He suffers from the fact that the generals complain about the treatment of them Schmidt. He feels insulted when Schmidt makes decisions without asking him. But on the other hand, he refuses to part ways with Schmidt. Schmidt is undoubtedly an intelligent officer I am surprised by his great efficiency and energy. But at the same time I resent it when Schmidt tries to teach the army commander, and all of us. I do not understand why he, with all his intelligence, does not notice how harmful to the work of his behaviour. Paulus should have finally pounded his fist on the table, should have fought back. He knows that we all support him. You know he'll never do that. That's why we have to help him. It would be good if you would talk in Vinitsa with Colonel von Zilberg, who deals with staff positions. Maybe he will understand the situation. Are you suggesting, therefore, that I take this step behind your father-in-law's back? You should know I'm not a man of intrigue. If we spoke to him, he would forbid it. But in his interest and in the interest of the staff, something must be done. I live with my father-in-law and know better than anyone how he is tormented by Schmidt's antics. He often talks to me about it and complains about him. We must put an end to it. Kutschenbach was right. The interests of the army command demanded that the situation changed. True, Paulus tried to hide the conflict from others. However, all staff officers, as well as corps commanders and division commanders, knew how much in the depths of his soul suffers our commander because of the bad character of the chief of staff. Having given my promise to take appropriate steps in Vinitsa, I bade farewell to Paulus's son-in-law. Nevertheless, the whole affair was not too pleasant to me. Was it right to speak to Colonel von Zilberg without informing Paulus? I had my doubts and decided to consult with the chief of operations and told him about my conversation with Kutschenbach. There is no other way we must help Paulus. This was the opinion of the chief of the operations department. The next day I flew to Venitsa without any interference. I had to carry out an extensive program. Our proposal to create retraining courses for candidates for officer positions from artillery and communications units was accepted by the personnel department after a detailed discussion with the heads of departments. Those who successfully completed the course were to be submitted to the personnel directorate for promotion to officer. This was the first success of my flight to the headquarters. But the second task, which concerned me personally, was solved better than I had expected I found a deputy for the time of my treatment. The appropriate department head answered me at once. Everything is working out perfectly. One lieutenant colonel from the personnel department has long been pushing us to use him at the front. He can first replace you, and after your return to take command of an infantry regiment of the 6th Army. As soon as he gives up his affairs here, we'll send him to you. I went in the best of spirits to Colonel von Zilberg. The words with which he greeted me made my mission easier. Well, Adam, what's Schmidt doing, the new chief staff? Did he get along with Paulus, or is he defiant? First of all, I must emphasize, Mr. Von Zilberg, that I didn't come to you on Paulus's instructions. If I had told him that I would talk to you about Schmidt, he would have forbidden it. The reason for my address to you was a conversation with Mr. Von Kutschenbach, Paulus's son-in-law, who, as you know, works in our headquarters as an interpreter. He is simply afraid for Paulus. Having characterized Schmidt's tactless behavior towards Paulus, I continued. I am afraid, as if the disagreement between the chief of staff and the commander did not have a retarding, even fatal impact on the command of the Sixth Army. The general command would have to weigh whether it would not be advisable to replace the chief of staff. 
I, of course, I cannot decide whether now is the right moment for this. Of course, we must talk to Paulus beforehand. Colonel von Zilberg shared my opinion. I doubted from the beginning that these two men could work together. I will talk to the Chief of General Staff of the Land Forces, Colonel General Golder, and present him with a proposal. After that, I went to Colonel Muller Hillebrand. There was not much time left before the flight, but my interlocutor knew the situation of the Sixth Army, so it did not need a lot of words for clarification. I formulated my proposal. In the rear units, there are many young soldiers who are suitable for frontline service. Would it not be advisable 106 to replace them with older soldiers, or such that are no longer suitable for the front? This would give the opportunity to fill in our most tangible gaps. I do not know whether it will do much. As far as I know, the companies are already using even prisoners of war as chauffeurs and auxiliaries. That is true, but I was also referring to units operating in the rear of the army, repair companies, etc. We'll think it over, Adam. Muller Hillebrand kept his promise to me in mid August. We received a number of marching battalions, which came in very handy, although they were far from enough to fully man the divisions. The colonel again promised to send the available marching units to the 6th Army first. I knew there was nothing more he could do. We said goodbye, and I flew back. Back in Golubinsky, I first appeared to Schmidt, and then to Paulus. It was clear to both that for the time being we must reconcile with the current lack of replenishment. Good that the personnel department gave permission to train infantry officers. Paulus, in his heart, hoped that the army will plant new divisions, 